Welcome to our third Urban Alliance Leaders Like Me event. Um, again, please change your name in the chat or put your name and region in, as your name. Um, and if you're a guest, please go ahead and add your organization so we know who's here representing. Um, again, as I said, this is our third session of Leaders Like Me, a series um, of youth-led conversations for Urban Alliance that is held um, with leaders of, um, of people of color. It's wonderful to see our students on video from across the country, as well as guests of the UA community. Just a quick few housekeeping notes as we continue on um, to our student MC. Please remember to stay on mute. Okay, that's really important so we're not distracted um, by any of the noise. Um, the meeting is going to be recorded and we will share the recording with all of the um, attendees after the event. During the conversation, if you have questions for our speaker, please put them in the chat box. We'll keep track of those and call on your questions um, for our speaker at the end of the session. And with that, let me stop talking and turn it over to our student MC, Kara Dukes. Kara's a star UA student and a senior at Western High School in Baltimore. She is currently interning at the Bridge Funding Group at the Bank United and Urban Alliance. Kara, please take it away. Hello everyone, I'm Kara and I'm extremely excited to be interviewing Mr. Glenn Jackson today. Mr. Jackson is the Chief Diversity Officer of MIT Bank. MIT Bank is a longtime partner of Urban Alliance and hosts interns across DC and Maryland. Mr. Jackson has been with MIT Bank since 1999, where he has held positions in the company's finance, treasury, and retail divisions before serving as Chief Operating Officer and Senior Director of Programs of Buffalo Promise Neighborhood an initiative led by, led by the bank to reverse the cycle of generational poverty on the east side of Buffalo, New York. Mr. Jackson is a Harvard graduate and is active on several community boards, including serving as a member of his local school district's Board of Education. Welcome and thank you for being here today. Let's get started. To begin with, can you give us a quick summary of your career journey and tell us more about the role of Chief Diversity Officer? Kara, first of all, thank you, and thank you to Urban Alliance for, for having me here today. Uh, it's an honor, and I'm humbled to be in front of you, so I want to thank you for that. Um, we won't talk about sort of your, your college decisions coming up here until until you make that, so we'll, we'll get there. And Ms. Doss, thank you. Um, I was laughing before most people got on that apparently we got the same memo today because we're wearing the same color scheme and our hair is the same, too. So, so thank you for that. I, I feel as comfortable as I could right now. Um, <clears throat> You know, I'll give you a little bit of my background, and uh, and I wish I could tell you, as I was sort of sitting on the cusp of, of the space that you're sitting in right now, and I was thinking about who I would be when I grow up, that I actually knew, because I didn't. Um, and I wish I could tell you now, you know, 22 years removed from college, that I that I know what I want to be when I grow up, and I still don't. Um, but but here's what I know, and it, and it's really exciting for me, uh, is that. Many of the spaces I sit in, including the seat I sit in today, I was part of creating. 20 years ago, there was no such thing as the, as the chief diversity officer. 20 years ago, if you said the word diversity, they were talking about a portfolio or investment. Now we're talking about cultural transformation. Now we're talking about how do you get specific about populations that have been underrepresented and start to see them in the, in the pipeline. We talk about how do you sort of see yourself, and if you can't see yourself, how can you truly be yourself? So when I started a long, long time ago, <clears throat> I stepped into finance because I was good at math, right? It just came easy to me. And I, and I said, well, I got an economics degree from, from an, <laughs> an amazing school. And let me step back further. I grew up, my father's black, my mother's white. I'm six foot one and my sister's taller than me, my older sister. So in our household, there's lots of competition one of which I'm still trying to win. I'm hoping the gravity starts to pull her back sooner than me so I can finally be taller than her. Um, but we always were taught that education mattered. Education was the most important thing. And while we were both athletically gifted as well, it was always education first. So I got to watch my sister um, start ahead of me and, and leverage her, her academic abilities and athletic capabilities and actually launch herself off to Cornell University. And that was one of sort of my first role models to watch my older sister do that. Um, I also, as I was going through when I played sports as well and academics were first, uh, I recognized something in myself. We grew up in the suburbs. We grew up in a predominantly white um, school district. We were one of a few, maybe a handful of families that were people of color. We always knew we were different. 
from the moment I can remember, I remembered I was different. And that's a weird feeling, right? And that's something when you're living consciously, knowing when you walk in a room, people may be looking at you for the way you look, not for, for sort of the content of underneath. Uh, and that was something that at first I thought was across the bear, or I thought it was a weight. What I've realized now, 22 years later, it was a gift. Because I was always thinking about what next. I was always thinking, what might somebody else be thinking? And in doing that, I had to go through so much information and scenarios to make sure that I was thinking about every possible solution in that room before people were thinking about anything at all. So that was how I stepped into my role at the, at the, at the, the bank ultimately. And that's how I step through life right now. Um, one of the things I told a group, Kara, that was young, probably about 10 years ago, I said, if I could go back and talk to my 18 year old self, I'd say one thing and one thing only, get comfortable being uncomfortable. The things that people present to you that you're afraid of, go speak in front of people. Kara, like you're today, like go host this and ask them questions. Those things that scare you today, you should be comfortable with tomorrow. So go at those things. And as I've sort of gone through every step of my life, instead of sort of shunning or being afraid of doing those things, I've actually gone from that to embracing that discomfort. There's one way to grow your comfort zone. It either shrinks continuously as you stay away from everything, or you grow it by getting discomfort and then growing, just like working out. All of you probably work out. Why do you work out? Do you like it? No. Does it suck? Yeah. Does it hurt? Yeah. But guess what happens? You get bigger, stronger, faster. You feel better. You get healthier. Pain precedes growth. Therefore, discomfort precedes growth when you think of your soul, when you think of like who you are and you evolve. So I've stepped through finance, treasury. Um, I've been in the retail space. I've managed deposit portfolio, billions of dollars of interest expense and dollars at the bank. Um, but now I get to step into a role where I actually can focus on you. I can focus on people. I can create pathways where people can see themselves, not just to be a CDO, but to who can be a CEO. The next CEOs are sitting in this room. That's who I want to talk to. The folks that can run the entire organization, the folks that are going to help us run the world. So I'll stop there, Karen, and, and, and let you keep going with the questions, but, but thank you for that. That was such an amazing answer. Thank you. We all know that representation matters at every level. As the chief diversity officer at one of just four Fortune 500 companies with a black CEO, what do you believe businesses need to be doing to cultivate more leaders of color? Just do it. <laughs> it's so easy, right? Like it, it, we, we sit there and, and um, listen, let me, let me step back. It's easier said than done. 2020 happened. And most of us who are highly aware we're highly aware, right? We grew up in a nation that frankly was, was based in, in, in racism and in systemic discrimination. It's real, right? And if you don't believe it, by the way, we're all affected by it. We all have unconscious bias that we're steeped in every single day. You see things and pictures and things that really are just gonna influence you to think a certain way. So when we woke up in that space, we had to like have a sort of, let's get around and figure out how do we unpack this stuff? right? And how you do it is you go tap other people you've never spoken to before. And what, what people were waiting for was someone else to do something. Well, I'm not racist or I'm not, name that thing. I'm not misogynist. I'm not. Listen, um, we all have the ability to unpack this and we need every single one of us to go on our journey. Uh, so one of the things we did at the bank was we said, listen, let's go ask ourselves as an organization, what would they have to see at this organization? Forget about everyone else. Everyone's throwing money at stuff. Let's just throw money at it. We'll solve the problem. Never worked, hasn't worked in 80 years. You need to take an internal look, look at your own house and figure out how do we do this better? And we asked our, our, our employees that, and they said, I need to be able to see myself. Remember your first question. I have to be able to see myself. The second thing they said is not only do I have to see myself at every level of the organization, right? That's representation. They said, I have to be able to be myself. Think about that. You don't walk in the room and then act a certain way because that's how you're expected to act. And I don't mean like, I mean, bring your best self, right? I mean, you don't have to pretend you're in social circles that you're not in because otherwise you're not going to ride to the top. You don't have to pretend you golf or play football, name that thing because it's so misogynistic and it's, and it's, it's anchored in sort of male ego. That's not real, right? Like how do we create an environment where actually people belong and can be their best at work every single day and bring their lived experience and passion into their day job. Now, if they could do those first two things, 
be themselves, right? See themselves and be themselves. Imagine what kind of bank we could be for the communities that we serve, every community we serve, not just certain ones. And frankly, that's the journey we're on as an organization. So when you ask the question about representation, it matters. How can we possibly reflect in our products and services and how we serve Baltimore if we don't have people from Baltimore in our system creating our products and services for Baltimore? You can't. It's impossible. So how do we have pipelines of talent, including yourself, coming through our organization, sharing their ideas and passions and changing and transforming us throughout the entire organization? And that's the only way you change it, right? And at the end of the day, people thought diversity was because it was the right thing to do. I'm, I've got a secret. It's the only thing. And if you do not do it, you will not survive as an organization. And you students are going to have a demand for your talent in ways you can't possibly imagine. I didn't have it. Many of the adults in this have not had this. You're going to see a demand for your talent that's going to go off the chart. And you're going to be able to, to select and choose where you want to be. And you're going to pick the, the environment that actually you belong and you can change it. So that's the space where we're competing in for now. And at, at the end of the day, it's bigger than banking. It's all of corporate America that's the space. Every space we occupy is the place where we need to change it to make it better and make it a place where everyone can belong. You're muted. I was saying that was incredibly powerful and so true. Thank you so much for that answer. And our previous Leaders Like Me event, the the topic of generational wealth came up in the chat box a few times. I know that good corporate citizenship is important to MNC Bank. What is your philosophy around community impact and the role that banks should play to help the community they serve build stronger economic future? You guys are asking the best questions in the world. Now, now um, this is my opinion, but it's bigger than this. Um, wealth, generational wealth, how do you build it? What does an individual do? When you think about household wealth, what's the first word? Household, you buy a home. How do you buy a home? You have access to credit. Do you have access to credit? If the answer is no, how the heck can you build generational wealth? If you're a small business, so get off the resale now. If you're a small business, how do you start a business? Access to capital. How do you get a loan to start your business? That's how you start your business, that's how you build your business, and that's how you succeed at business. If you're a major corporation, how do you do that? Access to capital. By the way, who are the gatekeepers to capital? Banks. If people think, right, think about this for a minute. If you wanna change the system, if you wanna remove inequities in the system, we are it. If we change banking, we can change all the inequities throughout this entire nation. I do, I, that sounds like a massive statement, but tell me it's not true. If we provide access to individuals, small businesses and corporations equitably, not equally, equitably in ways that they need it, guess what happens? It changes the entire game. People can begin to build generational wealth. Small businesses can start to just start in general and be supported along their path and journey and corporations can build, right? So at the end of the day, generational wealth starts with access to capital. And we as, as bankers, frankly, if we can figure that out, which we have to, right? It changes the entire game. So this is why when, when 2020 happened, you see these banks raise their hand and say, we're gonna throw a hundred million dollars over here and a hundred million dollars over there. It's a shell game. Show me what you're doing to hire people from the communities. Show me what you're doing to increase capital to communities. Show me what you're doing to provide opportunities to those communities to be successful, be it individually, generating family wealth, generating small business wealth, or commercial wealth. And at the end of the day, that's the answer. So really smart question. And frankly, as you think about it, the banking system can change everything if we just so choose. And at the end of the day, working for a bank with one of only two, it's the son to duck it as well, is the other um, black CEO of a bank, right? She just signed up for TIA. There are now two. I work for one of them. And frankly, Renee knows this, right? This is part of his responsibility. How do we drive this? We should be a leader, not a follower in this space. And that's a, that's, that's a journey I'm excited about us being on. 
And frankly, it's going to take more and more people to help tap in and start to change the whole system. I completely agree, as well as many of the interns, in the, as you can see in the chat. Um, at Urban Alliance, we learned a lot about how to keep a job, but less about how to advance in a company once you're there. You've been with m &T Bank for over two decades. What is your advice for employees who want to grow within a company? Yeah, so, so um, you, can, you have more control than any other person on your life. Matter of fact, you're the only person that has control. So I would, I would give you a, a couple of, of words of, of, of to, to remember. You control it, therefore you set the tone every single day as to what you wanna be and what you aspire to be. In my, in my most important point I would make to you is, I'm not here because of my individual contribution. I'm here simply because of all the people that are sitting behind me. You can't see them right now, but there are thousands who have supported me in every space I've ever occupied. There's a wave of support that every time you're in the moment with somebody, a human being, whatever moment that is, they can either be for you, be completely indifferent, or be against you. It's your choice. And if you're building that advocacy out and you're advocating for them as well, you're creating a network of people that help to advance you forward. And if you don't recognize that and you're worried about the last minute or the last person or the next person and not the person in front of you, you're missing the point. So be very intentional as you sort of start to navigate through corporations, build out your energy, build out your wave of support and be very intentional to go out and make and build relationships and own your story. You're going to be nervous, right? Everyone, they told me to network and I'm like, what does that mean? Like I go have coffee with someone like what? what? It just felt weird. It felt forced, right? But at the end of the day, it's not for the purpose of having coffee. It's getting to know someone. For the minute you know me, here's the thing. It's human nature, right? If you ask me and say to me, you come to me now, I have an opportunity for this role. I've got three names at the top of my head. You know why at the top of my head? Because I'm close to them and I probably just met them today or I just met with them today. And if you're top of somebody's mind, you're top of the opportunity list. If they're not thinking about you, Kara, because you're putting your head down and working really hard and nobody knows, nobody knows. So you control that, grab the wheel, and make sure you're very intentional about your relationships you're building. Make sure when you start that, that conversation with someone, you always end it in a, in, a, in, a, in a reframed positive moment. So when that person walks away, they say, Kara Dukes, I really like her. I might not be able to tell you why, I just like her. Because when your name comes up and you're not in the room, that's where advocacy happens. That's where somebody says, Kara Dukes is awesome. And guess what? Then you, your name is checked when they say, here's an opportunity. Here's the next thing we're going to give it. It's Kara Dukes. She's a go-getter. She came up, met with me, and I, I, there's something about her. Now, if they walk away and they're like, oh, I don't remember her, that's your fault. <laughs> right? Or if they're like, yeah, she was completely distracted, again, stay in the moment. That's your fault. So own it. Grab the wheel. Be very intentional in the relationships you build and make sure you double back. Right? You check in with people. You thank them. Be gracious. I'm here because of the thousands of shoulders I'm standing on right now. And every day, every person I meet, they might think I'm mentoring them. They're equally mentoring me. It doesn't matter the age. It doesn't matter the position. I'm learning from you. Like, that's the whole point. Learn from them, get their gift, and give them a gift, and keep going. Thank you again. Um, since we're on the topic of advice and mentoring, what has your experience as both a mentor and a mentee been like as you came up through the ranks of MIT Bank. Do you have any advice for us as we begin to build our first mentoring relationship? Yeah. Um, he, here's the thing, right? At first, you're not going to know what to talk about, right? You're going to get in front of somebody and you're going to be nervous and you're going to start just, you just feel like you throw off everything about your life on one thing. And you're like, oh gosh, I messed it up. Um, the more you talk about your story, the better it gets. The more you talk about your story, the more you recognize yourself in it. If you're not telling your story, you're just in a moment at all times, right? The more you go back and tie it back, you start to realize yourself throughout your entire life. I'll give you an example. Somebody asked me the other day, you know, when did you know that this role was right for you? I didn't know until a year and a half into it, just about six, eight months ago. And I, and I knew it because somebody asked me, like, what, you know, when I go back into my history and I think back to when I was younger, what were the moments that were impactful to me? 
You know, I remember at a very young age, my mother would, would, would bring my sister and I to, um, she worked at a group home, severely disabled people. And I remember the moment of fear when I walked in because it was a fear of the unknown, right? And anytime you're, you're experiencing something unknown, you're fearful. And that's where unconscious bias sticks in and all the fear and all this other stuff. And then it became part of my family. They became part of my family. They became part of me. And I remembered at a moment and having a moment of clarity saying, oh my goodness, I can't believe I was judging in the beginning because I was so afraid. And how could I possibly do it? It almost broke me. And then I realized that through every part of my life, I always brought that with me. And I reminded myself in those moments, don't ever judge anybody, right? Even if you're fearful, why are you fearful? Is it warranted? And as you build that relationship, you realize it never is and it never was. And then you realize just like everything else, there, it's another human being. And by the way, leading with empathy and starting to build from there was just so important for me. So that was part of my story. And I'd forgotten that. I had forgotten that my parents had very intentionally brought my sister and I at a young age into all of these circles with people that were different than us. And every time it was the same thing over and over again. They're just people. They're just people. They're just people. They're just people. They might look different. They might, it didn't matter. The stories were like all amazing and unique. But at the end of the day, the common theme was they were just people. And that exposure and experience, and then I realized who I was in that moment was, I was always the person all the way back to when I was young that would bring people together. That I couldn't understand why people were sitting over there versus over there, whatever there. Well, I didn't belong. That's why I felt that way. But I also wanted others to belong. And that was my drive. So find yourself, find your story, share your story, and understand that that's going to drive the passion. And when you start to combine your passion with your capabilities and all the learning and education you get in your drive, it's the magic moment. That's when work goes from work to actually love, right? I get to change. I get to uplift. I get to, I get to take people that are highly talented, highlight them, amplify them, and let them change us as an organization. That is the best way. If you want to talk about success, every time someone else is smiling and feeling good about themselves, I feel really good about myself. That's it. That's my measure, right? Anyone I come up to, if I've helped them, I feel really great about myself. Nothing else matches it to me. So own your story. Make sure you're intentional. Mentor and mentee, it's the same thing. You're going to have a ton of mentors, but know that you're also a mentor, even to the folks that you think are, are your mentor. You're sharing with them a gift. Make sure you share your gift with them as well. Thank you. You have some amazing advice. So we're going to ask you for a little bit more. Um, what yes, is your please. advice for young people beginning their financial journey? How do we invest in ourselves now to start to build future financial stability? <clears throat> Get comfortable investing in yourself. Right? You have to put yourself first. And I, I mean, you hear the, word, the term self-care too. Take care of yourself. I didn't do that, by the way. I didn't. So you're looking at a failure in that. Um, I have all sorts of physical sort of breakdowns and, and, and stuff happened to me over the course of the, probably the first 10, 15 years of, of my career. I wasn't taking care of myself, frankly, and it does damage and you have to be careful. So, so, so make sure that you're thinking about self-help and, and self-care. You have to do those things. Um, keep, what, was the, what was the question? Oh, I'm sorry, Kara. Um, the question was, what is your advice for young people beginning their financial journeys and how do we invest gotcha. in ourselves financial. now? Okay. Yeah. So, I, you know, invest in yourself. Um, financial journey. Own it. Like, don't go get a bunch of credit cards and spend. Horrible idea. I did it. Terrible idea. Terrible outcome. Feels amazing. Look at me. I'm an adult. I can spend. Yeah, you can. Anyone can spend. Who can save? And you're going to hear the power of compound interest your entire life. You won't know how powerful it is until it's too late. So take our word for it. Like all adults say, oh, just trust me when you get older. Like if you're going to trust one thing, trust that. Compound interest works. But you know how you, the only way you can take advantage is if you start now. So take your first paycheck and you put a dollar amount in. And you, and you don't even get used to having those dollars. And you let that happen over time. And you forget about it. And every time you get a raise, you take some of that and shove it back in and you just let that keep happening over time and over time. And you'd be shocked if you just did that, start with $50 and do that over the course of your life. You wouldn't have to do anything else. You wake up 25 years later and seemingly have a million dollars and you'd be like, how did that happen? You'll never know. 
You don't have to know. It's compound interest, right? So if you're going to do one thing, pay yourself first and make sure that you're just very consistently doing that over time. Um, you know, we, we think we have to race for things. Who are you trying to be? Who are you trying to beat? Who are you trying to chase? Whose life do you want? You own one life and it's yours. And no life is better than yours. If you're looking at someone else and what they have, and that becomes the driver of you and your decisions, it's the worst decision you could ever make, right? And I look at now, I've got two almost teenage daughters. Whew, we are, they're spending some stuff and, we're, and it's like, no, you, you, you have to part with this stuff. You have to part with cash. If you want that, what are you gonna do for it? What are you gonna do to, to work for it? Is it a want or a need? And to hear my daughter say back to me and say to my, to my wife, is it a want or a need? Exactly. If it's a need, let's have a conversation. If it's a want, save it up. And, and is it really at the end of the day? And that's amazing to watch them actually have that conversation. So be very smart. If you can save right from the beginning, learn and teach yourself how to do that. Pay yourself first. Uh, and, then, and then just go and be smart. You're going to make mistakes, by the way. And everything I say, I can only tell you this because I made a mistake first in every single aspect of everything I said. I, I didn't save at first. Bad idea. Am I okay now? Yeah. You can always pivot. Pivot, right? Mentorship. Never paid attention to networking my first 10 years. Was it a mistake? Absolutely. Course correct. Change it. You can always change it. No mistake you're going to make is going to be so big that you can't change it. Please remember that through all of it. Thank you. Um, for most of us, Urban Alliance is our first professional internship. What was your first job or internship and what was the most important thing you learned from that experience? Oh man, I was scared to death. So <clears throat> I had an internship. I think it was, I was in college. It might've been freshman or sophomore year. And it was um, oof, a long, long time ago. Um, and it was called Rights Exchange. And it was, um, well, let me go back to this whole sort of, you know, relationship you built. The, the, the person that hired me for it was a Harvard alum who happened to graduate eight years prior to me. And he was looking for somebody to take a seat and in an internship, a paid internship. And it happened to be me because frankly, I was now in that space and he saw the connection and he saw the relationship built. Again, you can leverage these relationships. Um, so I sat in a seat and it was about digital content. Um, and I remember being scared. I didn't know what I was doing because I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Uh, and, 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 and then I learned a little bit of what I told you earlier, which is if you just sit at your cubicle and spin around not knowing what to do, you will never know what to do. Instead, I got up out of my seat, and it was hard, and then started asking people, what is it you do, right? Let me learn a little bit from you today. The next day, grab the next person. What is it you do? Tell me about that. And then all of a sudden, the clarity around what I was there to do became better. Start to ask very specific questions of what they're asking you, and then what they do. And when you show an interest in other people's work, there's no more exciting thing to a lot of people than to tell you what their story is and what their work is. And then you learn from it. And it actually helps you do your job better in two ways, because you've made a relationship. They now care for you. They're going to try to help you and you can help them. Right. So at the end of the day, when I say mentorship or build those relationships, it helps you and it helps them. And the, and the, and the sooner you realize that, uh, the better. So I think it was probably a 10 week program for me. I got to the end of it. And what's funny is um, his name was Teo. He just reached out to me two weeks ago and said, hey, a guy you went to, you graduated Harvard with now sits on a massive fund, I think, you know, our values align. Would you mind sharing his information with me and introducing us? And I said, absolutely, yes. So this was this relationship with somebody who was eight years older than me, that saw me, saw something in me, provided me the opportunity, which helped me springboard into my career after, after Harvard. And now he tapped me back 25 years later and asked for a favor. And of course I would, right? It's about relationship. Right. And it's about the give and the take and make sure at all costs you're giving because eventually somebody's going to be there to give to you. Thank you so much again. Um, you mm -hmm. touched on a lot of different skills that could be useful in anyone's career. But if you could pinpoint one skill that has been most useful in your career, what would it be and how did you develop it? I would say this, listening. 
Right. We get really good at telling stories and, 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 and talking about ourselves, right? You have to, right? Like, where's your resume? Like, you got to interview. You got to do it. You just get used to just firing it off. Um, you know what we're not good at as a society? Listening. And, and here's, and I don't mean like, okay, Kara's talking. Kara's talking. I'm thinking about what I'm going to say to everything she's saying right now. No, that's, that's not what I mean. Right? You being silent doesn't mean you're listening. I mean, you literally being thoughtful in listening. And then what your response to Kara is, wow, that's interesting. Like, tell me more about this thing. Or I had an experience like that. Can you tell me how this works? Listen, um, I, I learn a lot. The vast majority of what I've learned uh, is not through books, is not through class, uh, is not through, you know, sitting through lectures, right? Can I learn that way? Absolutely. I learn through individuals. I learned from, from, from having conversations with folks that are highly experienced at things, and they tell me the story. Because if you tell me functionally how things work, that's one thing. If you tell me the why behind it and why it's important and why it's necessary, that's an entirely different thing. And the sooner you can get to the why behind the what, which people are the key to, it changes everything. Um, so so that's, that's been sort of the key to me, uh, specifically when it comes to that. Thank you so much again. Um, think back to a tough moment in your career. How did you get through it and what did you learn from it? Uh, so, um, by the way, they don't go away. Like you're gonna have tough moments in your life and your career for your entire life and career. If you thought you made a ton of money and then all of a sudden you won't have moments, no, it's always about those moments. And it's how you react in those moments. And it's how you perceive those moments. Somebody asked me the other day, like, what's the best moment of your day? And I, I wanted to say at night when everyone goes to sleep and I can exhale. No, the real answer is the moment I open my eyes, I set the tone for the rest of my day. People tell you they wake up on the wrong side of the bed or you stub your toe, guess how their day goes? Poorly, you know why? That was the tone for their whole day. You know who said it? They did. So when I wake up, I have one moment of clarity in the morning and I choose how my day is going to go. And if something goes sideways, I choose in that moment to still push on and make it better. So I would tell you that every moment I've ever had in my life, I haven't been good at this. I'm still working on this every single day. I have to choose joy. I have to choose and decide every single moment how I'm going to perceive that and how I'm going to see the opportunity in it and the lesson to learn from it and move forward. One of the, the, the biggest points, though, and I'll be very specific for you, it was about three years ago, right before I took this job, probably four, and I was at Buffalo Promise Neighborhood. So here we were doing God's work, right? Here we are on the ground, the east side of Buffalo, and frankly, nothing better than literally being in the community. I have a basketball on that shelf here, and there was, there was 12 young men that I worked with, and we did, you know, on the weekends in between. We sort of were managing uh, an initiative where we were in two middle schools. So it was all education, right? We also managed and had coaching relationships, job coaching with the parents and everything else. These kids signed this basketball because on the weekends, we also had a, you know, a basketball camp, right? And it was the most satisfying work I've ever done in my life. And I felt like I was actually accomplishing something. And then I remember, right, all of my day jobs prior to that. And I looked at it and I said, well, wait a minute. Here we are as a bank spending lots of money and time and effort on the ground in a community trying to do the work. How are we as a bank for this community? That was our day job. Were we good enough as a bank for this community? Yet we were trying to be educators. And then I lost it. <laughs> Talk about a hard moment in my life. I had to reconcile the fact that we're doing all of this really good work and all the effort, yet we had lost our way somewhere when we just asked, but wait a minute, we're a bank, so how are we doing there? And it was amazing because I had a conversation with our chairman and CEO at the time, Bob Wilmer. And he asked me how it was going. And he started this work. He came into Buffalo and said, listen, if we don't have equitable education, how can we possibly have equitable outcomes? How can we possibly have a diverse workforce that represents and reflects all the communities we serve? He was on it. But we lost ourselves. And I said, listen, I feel really good about the work. But did you know we're not the best bank in that neighborhood? How is that possible? And he said, you've got to be kidding me. Right. And then we turned around and we started tapping in the retail bankers and the commercial bank. But then we, what do we have to do? We had to have a focus group and, and listen, not talk, 
listen to the community and say, hey, what do you think of us? They're like, we think you're great, but you might not be the bank of choice for us. So then we said, why not? And we listened and they told us, maybe we didn't have the products, maybe we didn't have the services. And we listened and we changed and we created. That flipped everything on our head. That was about five years ago. Talk about customer centricity. Talk about community. If we're, we're a bank for communities, lead with the community. Hold that community at your core as you're creating those products, those services, those pathways through your entire organization so that they can see themselves in your products, your services, and your people. It changed everything for me. So in that moment of darkness, we found a solution that frankly was sitting in front of ourselves. The whole, nobody said we couldn't do that. Frankly, he went off. Right. The next day I had 80 nasty messages like, what did you say to him? I'm like, I, don't know. I just told him what, the, what was up. And here we go. So so thankfully for his leadership. And he was the one that basically said, you know, he passed away a few years ago. You know, he tapped Renee, and Renee Jones, who, who again, we'll get him back here. I promise to, to have a conversation with you folks. Um, you know, Renee is his legacy. And Renee now can lead in this space. He's one of two bankers that are black. And frankly, now it's on us and it's our responsibility as an organization to continue to work at access to capital and to continue to make sure that these are the communities that we're serving in the best way that we can. And frankly, that means we're the best bank uh, for everyone that works for us and for all the communities that we serve. And at the end of the day, that's our mission and that's our purpose. Thank you so much. I know that many of us can take your advice and use it throughout different aspects of our lives. And now I want to do a fun lightning round. A fun questions before we open up for Q&A. Remember to type your questions in the chat box and we will call on you to ask your question. Okay, lightning round, 60 seconds. Here we go. What is one thing you can't live without? Music. What's your favorite place in the entire world? I don't know yet. <laughs> What's one food you can eat forever? Pizza. What's the last TV show you binge watched? Amend, the fight for America. Will Smith was the, the, the narrator. Go check it out, it's about the 14th Amendment. What's the best book you have ever read? Um, you know, it all matters in the moment. So How to Be an Anti-Racist was a good one. Stamped from the beginning was a good one. I love um, Professor Kendi. Uh, check out his stuff, it's really good. There's lots of good stuff out there. What is your personal theme song or just favorite song in general? Love yours, J. Cole. Who is your personal hero? My father. I know you kind of tapped on this already, but what's the most important part of your day? There it is. The moment I open my eyes. Set the tone. What's the phone app that you use the most? You really want to know? Yes. TikTok? Is it weird? Is it weird that it's TikTok? Listen, real quick, I know it's 60 seconds, but I got to tell you this. Um, I am fascinated with TikTok. There's no other place you can open up that you see so many people that are not familiar to you doing familiar things. Think about that for a minute. You can open it up and you see nothing but people who may or may not be familiar to you from other geographies, cultures, religions, name that thing, doing familiar things. Think about what that does to us. That allows for us to get familiar with the unfamiliar real fast. That allows for us to break barriers that I've never seen broken in this speed through social media. And you can learn a lot from it. So I, most adults think I'm insane when I say that, but frankly, it's on my phone because my daughter got it. I'm like, this is crazy. And then I'm like, this is kind of cool. Oh, what is that? Like, it, I, I, don't, I don't interact other than scroll. I don't like things because I know it's gonna, the, the good old machine's gonna take over, but TikTok. And lastly, what's your favorite movie of all time? I have a few, um, but but I'll tell you I'll tell you one, and, and it and it applies to all three. Um, my parents knew from a young age that that the human condition was something I was I was always interested in, and I don't know that I could have articulated that to you even ten years ago, but it's something that was very true. So my dad would expose me, unwilling to, by my mom, to to to, to age inappropriate movies. Um, and, and he would, he knew that I could handle them. At least he thought I could. Um, but frankly, um, they were things that I was heavily interested in. The first one that he exposed me to was the elephant man and the elephant man to me, he's like the movie ended and you sat there for 20 minutes sobbing. 
And the Elephant Man, if, if you don't know, um, Joe Merrick, and what it was about is he was so severely disabled physically, right? And his appearance was just, they, they, they used him in circuses and things like that. Now, at the end of the day, the, the movie, I could see the beauty in him behind everything else that people couldn't see. And at the end, to watch him sort of die, um, it was a drama, clearly. Um, it just broke me that people couldn't see what I could see. And that was the thought, and that was probably way too early, and I was sobbing. And I carry that with me, right, just like, the, you know, what I told you about my mother. The other one that's on the end of that decade, and I'm talking about the 80s now, so you guys were never even close to this planet, um, was, was Glory. Another movie. Now, that was at the end of the 80s. I was a little bit older. I was probably 11, 12 years old in Glory, right? The 54th Regiment. They fought for the North. And frankly, uh, same thing. I sat and I wept at the end of that movie as I'm watching bodies sort of just slow down. And I'm not going to tell you anymore. You just got to watch it. And, and, and I just remembered, like, how could this possibly be this injustice? How could we not be supportive? How could we not? And by the way, it's talking about the Civil War, but some of those same battles we're fighting today. Frankly, we're fighting them today. Um, so never did I think that movies like that would move me and affect me so much that now my day job is to seek and find injustice, right? Rooted out unconscious bias through all of our systems, process, procedures and then change a system that has held us in place for so very long. Um, I didn't see it, it was never clear to me until the clarity I've gotten over the last 18 months. And frankly, it's, it's, it's powerful, um, it's frightening, uh, but it's time. Um, so th those movies, it goes all the way back 40 years ago uh, and, it, and, it, and it's driven me into a space where now we have more of an ability to change it. And frankly, you guys are the leaders that are gonna lead us into to a, to a new, a new way, a way of being, and we now have the ability to unpack it. So I'm really excited about our future. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we're running a little, we're running a little long, but would you love to answer some questions from our other students? Do you have a few more minutes? Okay, perfect. Absolutely. Um, please forgive me if I pronounce anyone's name wrong. Um, first up, we have Cameron Miles from Baltimore. Um, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, how are you? So my question for you or questions for you, uh, how do you stay motivated when faced with a difficult task and how do you deal with stress that is caused by your job? Oh, man, um, ask them again. That's how stressful it is. <laughs> um, the first one was, how do you stay motivated when faced with a, with a challenge task? And the second one, how do you deal with stress that is caused by your job? Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Cameron. Um, I stay motivated because everyone around me, right? That wave of support is my wave of support, but I am for them as well. So my motivation is if I fail, I fail for all of us, right? This isn't about me anymore. It's, 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 it's if I fail, if I can't, if I can't move this, if we can't change this, then it changes for none of us. And frankly, that, that's, that's, that's heavy and it causes the next question, which is the stress. Um, I also rely heavily on the people that I've built these relationships with to help spread some of this, this weight. For a long time in my life, I carried it by myself. I didn't even expose sort of my wife and my kids to it. And that's dangerous. Um, you have to make sure that you're spreading it. And now that you can build networks that you can help to share some of the pain, share some of the struggle, because you have answers and solutions that other people can use. So don't go at it alone and tap sideways. And, and that's how I deal with it. The same answer for my motivation are the same people that help me with my stress. Thank you so much. Um, Next up, we have the Danique Jennings from Detroit. I'm so sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Yeah. It's fine, it's Dejanik. Hello, my question was, what makes, it, what makes um, you passionate about what you do? Um, <clears throat> you know, Dejanik, it, it, it goes right back to the people. I get most excited when I see people succeed. I get most excited when somebody has an idea and then I watch them 
make it happen and make it real, right? That's, that's success to me. So what's most passionate about is there's nothing more satisfying to me than watching people achieve and be what they aspire to be. Um, the biggest trap in that, not the biggest trap, the challenge I face though is most of us don't think big enough. And I would ask, and I'd ask each and every one of you to think about what I just said there, right? What do you aspire to be? Typically the answer is not big enough, go bigger. Like what's holding you back from thinking extremely big? What, what's, what's holding you back from saying, I'm going to name that massive thing that seems completely massive. Well, we've got rovers on Mars, right? We've got rockets that land themselves. What? It looks like CGI. It doesn't even look real anymore. But the only way you can do that is if you aspire to do something incredibly amazing, not just sort of step function your way through. Um, so what makes me passionate is watching people achieve, but it's watching them dream, come up with the idea, and then get there. Uh, and, and, and the more you watch that happen, the more passion I get and the more passion I drive and I drive towards doing the same thing and recreating it over and over again with more people. So really good question, Dejanik. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, next up, we have Thomas Harb from Chicago. What does a chief diversity officer do in the day to day? Oh, man. Next question. Um, you know what, Thomas, I, I, no, let me just say this, and this is actually part of my personality. Um, no two days are the same, which I love about it. Um, but I will say this, on most days, I feel like I'm a psychologist, right? I'm trying to unpack, um, I'm trying to unpack inequities of a system but I'm also trying to unpack each and every one of our inequities individually and unconscious biases, right? Because everyone has a different definition of what diversity is. Everyone else has a different lived experience and how they've experienced this world. Um, so to try and reconcile it all together, is, is, it can be, can be a big challenge. So, you know, in any given day though, I would tell you this, 80% of my conversations are one-on-one. -on -one. Right, and what that allows for me to do is, is, is listen, learn, and share, and amplify. And then I take that from meeting to meeting and person to person, and it helps to scale the work through and to support the work through. And then I attach people. I'm like a, a chief dot connector. Like literally just like, oh, go talk to Thomas. Jeremy, go talk to Dijanique. Like it just, you do that. And once you do that, you knit it together and you find out people's capabilities, where their passions are. And it's like a puzzle. It starts, the pieces start to make sense. And I just find my, my, myself sliding people around into those spaces so then they can sort of achieve it faster. Um, I know that probably sounds crazy, but that's, that's what I spend most of my time doing. Uh, and then again, a lot of our executives, right, are trying to drive this through massive parts of the organization with thousands of people. That's hard to do, right? If you have 17,000 people in an organization, they all have different dreams. So how do we align those dreams behind our mission and purpose to make a difference in people's lives. And the best part is, if you're making a difference in their lives, they can go make a difference in everyone else's lives in the communities that we serve. And that's why we're here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And for our last question, what is one thing you want Urban Alliance students to remember from today's conversation? Um, I would just all want you to email Renee and tell him uh, that I was better than him. <laughs> totally kidding. Um, listen, I, I it, here's what I hope, right? I, I hope you learn that there was no secret, right? At the end of the day, there is no secret. You have full control over your destiny. You can't think big enough. Right, you have the tools within you already. The fact that you're sitting in this conversation right now means you're there, you have something to give. So go give it, figure your story out, tell your story. The better you tell it, the more you tell it, the better you get. And people then can advance your story for you and make sure you do the same thing for them. So it's your sort of, it's yours to take, right? Yours to own. I said, love yours by J. Cole, because there is no better life than yours. Frankly, that's it. That's the key. 
there is no better life than yours. And if you're focusing on everyone else's, you missed the point. So take control of it. Um, I hope this was helpful. Again, I've learned a ton. If you're not continuously pushing yourself into that point of discomfort, getting comfortable being uncomfortable, you missed the point. That's how you learn. If you're not building relationships and helping people aspire to be, right, and dragging them forward with you and they you, you missed the point. You're not alone in this. You have each other in this space right now. You're going to continue to build that weight bigger. Picture a, a million people behind you. You need a million more. And frankly, not only will they tell your stories, you're going to amplify theirs. Everything you heard from me today was not just my story. It was an amalgamation of everyone else behind me who've helped me, and hopefully I have helped them as well. Thank you so much, Mr. Jackson. It was an honor to speak with you today. Um, this was one of our best sessions we have ever had. I'm going to throw it back to Ms. Deborah to close us out. All right, and thank you all for coming to our third Leaders Like Me event. If you can, just go ahead and do the little clap emojis for our speaker. It was a great um, speaker that we had today. Glenn and Kara, thank you both for such an inspiring um, conversation. The questions were great. The answers were even better. So thank you again. And so next month, we'll be speaking with Michael Stratmanis, Chief Engagement Officer of the Obama Foundation. So super exciting there. And in May, we'll hear from Cecilia Munoz, who served as the director of White House Domestic Policy Council under President Obama. So a great, an, again, another great speaker. Keep an eye out for your emails for another registration link for our next upcoming events, as well as a video of this session. Again, thank you all and enjoy your evening. And if you're still around, go ahead and put my, uh, put your stuff in the checks. I still wanna know more about y'all hometown. So thank you guys, appreciate it, bye. See ya. Um, Tara, great job, Bye. thank you, Ms. Tara. Um, thank you, Mr. Thanks Gold. everyone.